Okay. Thank you everyone for joining us. We hope you are all safe and staying strong during these hard times. Uh, going forward, we will continue with our online shiurim. Our people are no strangers to persecution and hard times. And throughout it all, what traveled along with us was our holy Torah, our Liviat Hen. Our Torah is our covenant and provides us with clarity and comfort in the hardest times. So may our studies be a merit for our nation. Uh, tonight we are launching our member series titled Great Jewish Historians with J.J. Kimchi. About our speaker, J.J. Kimchi is a PhD candidate in the field of modern religious philosophy at Harvard University, where he specializes in the intersection between modern European philosophy and post-Enlightenment Jewish thought. His academic essays and translations have been published in both academic and popular venues. J.J. received his undergraduate education at Shalem College, Jerusalem, where he double majored in Western philosophy and Jewish thought. Prior to that, he spent two years learning in Yeshivat Haaretzion and completed his military service in the 101st Division of the IDF's Troopers Brigade. Born into a family of renowned British rabbis and educators, JJ had been in has been intensely involved in Jewish education for the past 12 years. JJ currently serves as the Orthodox educator at MIT Hillel. And I will add that he had a wonderful essay in the Wall Street Journal, I believe, or New York Times, and also with, was on, um, on uh, national TV and uh, really put on a good uh, show them. So thank you for standing up for us. And with that, thank you everyone for, for being here and for anyone who's going to be uh, watching afterwards. And with that, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to the Chabura for having me back. I'd like to echo uh, what was said just now regarding um, that everything we learn and everything that we do uh, in these times should be directed towards the, um, you know, towards those who have been, the recovery of those who've been injured and towards the safety and security of our brothers and sisters in Israel and to the uh, success of Tzahal and their operations. Um, regarding our topic for today and for the next few uh, lectures in a row and so we have a two-part lecture course uh we have three lectures now uh, in october 2023 and hopefully three more lectures in 2024 surrounding a subject that i find fascinating and one of the most interesting parts of studying history and it's a field that has been emerging for the last couple of decades but really it's something which um there's a lot more work to be done especially in the jewish sphere and, and you know more books and more articles have been published which is a field that i like to call the history of history um and which is the topic of how history is um is recorded by whom it is recorded to which purposes it is recorded and the governing assumptions of those recording it okay <clears throat> and a little bit of background to this i'm going to give a bit of general background in terms of studying historiography and then the jewish background and then we're going to jump into our uh, figure for today um and so it goes as follows there was a time in the 19th century um during the heyday of let's say european academia uh, in which history was considered what they call a wissenschaft a science something which was uh, undertaken by scientists something impartial objective something that the historian was to study documents and in an as detached and as impartial manner as possible lay out the facts in front of the uh, in front of the reader uh, and one of the uh, senior practitioners was a man called Leopold, Leopold von Ranke uh, of the 19th century um Germanic Academy, um, and he had a famous line which was quoted and requoted in many introductions uh, uh, to many books on the subject. Uh, that he said that historians have to um, have to try and convey to their reader, and I believe this was the phrase "vs eigenisch gewesen sich," which means um, that which really happened, or that which truly happened. Okay, and that was the goal of scientific, objective, impartial history in the nineteenth century. However, in the mid twentieth and late twentieth century, the scene changed quite considerably, uh, because of the realization that there is no real such thing as pure objectivity, and that the historian sitting down to write history doesn't give something like uh, an objective account, but rather the historian, usually himself, at least until now, the, the historian themselves um, are part of the process. Right, the historians aren't quite like scientists. They're not studying something like theoretical physics. Rather, they are somewhere in between a scientist and, let's say, a novelist or a journalist, in the sense that they are crafting a story, and the way in which they craft the story, and the, the tools through which they craft the story is actually very important to how the story eventually gets told. Right, <clears throat> and I think uh, a good. Um, metaphor in a way for how history is often conducted uh, is if you think of a court of law right so you have a court of law and, and you know a certain person is accused of having done a certain thing let's say uh, committing a murder or whatever it is and so you have the fact presented to the court and then you have the two lawyers of each side you have the counsel of the defense and you have the prosecution both of them will try and spin a story based on the same set of facts to the jury in order to convince the jury to decide one thing or another right and of course 
you know, there is a range of historians. Not all historians are so blatantly ideologically, um, you know, uh, um, skewed in one direction or other. But nonetheless, it has come to be realized that the person writing and and collecting and recording and crafting the story has an essential role to play in how the story is being told. Okay, and that's the basis for being interested in the history of history. Who 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 writes history? So there are a few questions whenever reading. Um, <clears throat> a work of history, there are a few questions which should be on the mind of any uh, individual, any uh, reader, which goes as follows. So firstly, who is the historian? Okay, who is writing the history? Who, wh what, what were his circumstances? When did he live? When, what, you know, what were his experiences? What was his background, his education? A profile of the historian themselves. Um, on what did the historian focus? Okay, <clears throat> there's another fascinating question because the focus of historians has actually undergone precipitous shifts in the last few decades. You know, did the historian focus on kings and their wars? Did they focus on a social history, an economic history, an intellectual history? What what was the history that was being told? What what is the story? That is being is being told here. Okay, um, so that's that's another important question. Um, for whom did he write? This is a very important question. We're going to get to today when we discuss Josephus, because some historians have specific audiences or specific clients in mind. That's very important, and and their history cannot be understood unless you have that um, in uh, in mind. Um, another question is how careful was the historian? On what did they base themselves? Did they show their working? Did they say which sources they have? Did they copy down the sources carefully and punctiliously, or did they just Paraphrase? Did they make stuff up? Did they, you know, what kind of liberties did each historian take? And finally, what were the governing assumptions, um, ideological assumptions, methodological assumptions that each historian had? Now, these are questions that one must have when reading any history of, you know, of anyone um, um, from, you know, the ancient Greeks, Herodotus, and Thucydides, all the way until today. These are a set of questions which should um, interest and accompany any uh, reader or writer. This becomes a little bit more uh, complicated and a little bit more precipitous when one dives into Jewish history. For the simple reason that Jewish history, uh, well, for a few reasons. Firstly, it's because the time and manner in which Jewish history was written is very unusual and very much unlike any or, or the recording of history for many other nations. Let me let me explain what I mean. The Bible, the Hebrew Bible, there is a big argument to what extent. It is history, to what extent it is supposed to be conceived of as history, and which books of the Bible are, are sort of, let's say, historically focused and oriented, and which one, which ones are, you know, uh, um, say, ethical stories or, or um, you know, or, or um, works of wisdom or anything else. There's a big genre question about the main, you know, the main found, the main textual foundation of the Jewish religion, namely the Hebrew Bible. There are similar questions that face. Uh, the rabbinic canon, right? Those who, who confront, you know, all the stories and everything that's written in, in Shas and the Midrashim, the same question arises. To what extent are these supposed to be historical? It's very unclear. And in fact, this is actually a very important point, is that within the Bible, you have at least the basics of storytelling are, let's say, respected, right? There's, in general, most books, there is some kind of linear chronology um, uh, respect. Whereas, for example, when you study rabbinic literature, it is absolutely not the case. You can find, you know, in various midrashim, a person who lived in one century suddenly appear in another century altogether, right? Pinchas was Eliyahu. Uh, really? In the rabbinic way of storytelling, the answer is yes, that's exactly how it was, right? Um, so, and, and, and so you ha have the rabbinic and you have uh, f f figures like Josephus and other uh, figures in the classical Jewish, um, uh, in, in the classical period of Jewish history. And then you have centuries and centuries of near silence from Jewish historiographers. OK, and this is a key point, which we're going to address more uh, when we get to the modern period, hopefully in, in, in the next part uh, of our series. But this is something very important that from the death of Josephus in about 100 uh, of the year 100 of the common era, there's very little Jewish historical writing, almost none, until you get to um, roughly the 16th century uh, and the beginning of modernity. And even then you have Azari Darasi, one or two other relatively minor figures. And until you get to the 19th century and the rise of Jewish modernity and the rise of um as I spoke of before, this the sort of lionization of history within the European academia and, and Jewish historians participation in this until that point for about 1800 years, you have almost nothing within Jewish history. And since 1800 till uh, since the 1830s or 40s until today, you have an explosion in, Jew in, 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 uh, in Jewish history. In fact, today, uh, history is called by a famous historian, Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi, the faith of fallen Jews. Right. And then there is something to that today. We'll speak about him in a moment where many Jews today who are not really connected to the Jewish religion or to the Jewish national project will often seize upon Jewish history and, and figures within Jewish history as a core part of their own Jewish identity. And this is very important. Um, 
there is it's sometimes the case when it comes to an, uh, an academic discussion, which I, I just mentioned, the sort of history of history. In this case as well, there's one book, a book which stands at the very center of this question when it comes to Jewish historiography. I'm going to hold it up. Uh, some of you may have read it or may have not. The book is called Zachor. I, I know for some reason because I'm... I'm um, it's hard to see. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm blurred. The book is called Zachor by Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi. It's a short book. It's about 100 pages long. Um, Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi was a professor of Jewish history at Columbia University. Um, I cannot recommend it highly enough. You could get through it on Shabbos afternoon, and it is the main theoretical treatment of this question that I, I'm proposing today: of who writes Jewish history, why, why was Jewish history written in the classical period, not at all written in the medieval uh, and, and, and early modern period, and suddenly an explosion in, in modern period, and how exactly does that work? What is the dynamics? And the Jewish academic world today is divided between those who uh, are very much fans of Yerushalmi's thesis on the subject, and those who very much oppose his thesis on the subject. And I don't really have time at all to get into it uh, entirely. I will say very, very briefly, um, very briefly, that, that one of the major planks of Yerushalmi's thesis is, is that Jews shifted from history to memory after the destruction of the second Beit Mikdash, the second temple, um, because they felt that they already had all the lessons of history. Okay, and basically his thesis is is that the Bible and the and the, uh, the Tanakh and Chazal essentially have a theory of what history is. History is at least for the Jewish people is that if they do well, then God will protect them and they'll be safe and they'll be on the land. And if they sin. God will expel them from the land and cause them terrible troubles until they repent and God will return them to the land. This is kind of this historical model, as it is, as it were. And everything else that happens in history from that point onwards was seen by, uh, by, by the rabbinic you know, intellectual elite as merely a variation on the same theme, right? So you have crusades, you have, uh, you know, uh, pogroms, you have inquisitions, you have whatever else. This is merely a reiteration of a very well-trodden theme. And therefore, why is it necessary to uh, to go into the detail, right? Jews essentially stopped recording their history for at least 1,600 years, maybe even about 1,800 years, precisely because they believed it. And, and according to your Shalmi, and again, read the book. It's it's uh, 100 pages long, and it, it's incredibly thought-provoking. It packs an enormous punch. Um, and, and according to your Shalmi, the act of resurrecting Jewish history is part of the modern rebellion against the Jewish religion. OK, and this is very important to know. In other words, the fact that we returning to history, rejecting this cycle is part and parcel of the rejection of many uh, elements of let's say, the classical Jewish religion, which included Zionism, of course, because Zionism was a return to history. It's a return to no, we're actually going to sort out our problems in the here and now and not just rely on, you know, God to redeem us when he thinks that our sins, you know, that, that, that we've uh, repented, et cetera, et cetera. Again, a complex thesis. I haven't done it nearly justice here, but it's very important to note that this it's, it's a very interesting and thought provoking thesis by Yerushalmi, buy the book or, or, or get the book, read it. Um, and and of course, again, many have disagreed, many have agreed, but this is, is something very much worthwhile uh, um, um, to think about. Now, and having said that, you will now understand why this uh, series that hopefully we will be uh, doing through the Chaburah, the first half, the first three lectures will be on pre-modern historians. So I'm going to do Josephus today, and then Avram Ibn Daoud or Ra'avat Harishon uh, uh, and Azaria de Rossi. These were three great historians pre-modern period. And then we're going to jump to the 19th century. We're going to do Heinrich Gretz, uh, Shimon Dubnov, and Gershom Shalom. These were three major historians of, of the period where scientific or let's say academic history had come into existence and that was something the Jews were suddenly doing again. And this is really a very sharp break in between these two, uh, sort of these two uh, periods and that's why I've divided it into two. Okay, so much for introductions. And again, I, I apologize for 15 minutes of introduction. Now we're going to go through the life and thought of, uh, life and, and writings a little bit of Josephus. Again, relatively surface level um, because we have about 40 minutes or so. I intend to spend about 40 minutes, 45 minutes talking about Josephus. And then open up for questions. Anyone who wants to ask me anything, um, um, again, I, I will do my best. But um, the point is, is to, to talk about Josephus and his life and his times, but also to sort of start him as the opening framework for a history, uh, for a history at the um, uh, history of Jewish history, essentially. Okay, so I'm now going to share my screen. Um, okay, actually, you know, before I do, it's important to note the centrality of Josephus, okay, the importance of Josephus, because in many ways, Josephus is the major source for Jewish life in during the mid to late Second Temple period. In fact, the late Second Temple period. Okay. And he, he, firstly, in terms of him describing his own life, he, uh, as we'll see, he wrote an awful lot, um, and and what he wrote is very important. But in many of the things that we're talking about, we don't have 
other sources for it, right? So I'll just give you a quick example. Everything that you heard that, that the, any of you might know about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, for instance, and, and all that, that comes more or less entirely from Josephus, okay? Um, we 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 know, you know, in uh, the the writing the Talmudic Mishnaic writings, you have references occasionally to Tidukim and and Pirushim and a tiny bit, but any information about what they believed, what they practiced, who they were, where they were, all comes from Josephus. And then the important question is, and we'll, we'll discuss it in a moment, how reliable is Josephus? And and when it comes to describing the Second Revolt and the period of Herod and the period of all the Maccabees, how reliable is he? Because so much of the period we only have really have Josephus to rely upon. And this is, again, a big problem at the heart of Jewish historiography, because you want to ask a question about the, the Second Temple period, classical Jewish period. Well, Josephus says X. OK, <laughs> good. Is that good enough? Do we trust that? OK, and then we're going to touch on that a little bit today. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, second. Um uh, minimize that and um okay <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about yeah good okay fine uh, we'll talk about a little bit about uh, uh, josephus now um, yes um so uh, very very briefly i'm going to go into josephus life uh, more fully but uh, the things that everyone knows about Ju josephus he was a, a leader of the uh, a commander of some part of the jewish revolt and uh, the revolt between the year 66 and 73 ce the jewish revolt against the romans uh, he later was adopted by the imperial family he moved to Rome, wrote an enormous amount, and we're going to go through those. Um, and he was, again, as I said, one of the most important sources for Jewish life uh, and culture in the ancient period. And now there are a few very important questions that I want to, to, to add. So, for example, was Josephus correct, right? So I gave the example before of the, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the various sects. Um, and I'll just give you a very brief example. So Josephus claimed, for instance, that the Pharisees, the Pirushim, who were the forerunners of the Chachamim, forerunners of Chazal, um, that's a little bit complicated, but but for, for a very uh, sort of broad definition, that, that's accurate. And um, he claimed, for instance, that the Pharisees, who he was a part of for much of his life, were very popular among the common people, right? The, the, the Tzidukim, the Sadducees, their, their sort of main enemies, um, were really this kind of temple-centered um, elite. And the Pharisees were much more popular in the um, sort of uh, in the rural areas and among the common people. And the Essenes were, you know, living in these caves in the in the desert and, and really were not in touch with the common people at all. Um, and that's really how Josephus sort of portrayed the scene at this time. And the question is, was he correct? In other words, was he just trying to self-flatter? Was he trying to portray his own sect, i.e. the Pharisees, as having popular support because that's what he wanted his readers to believe? Or is he actually accurate? And, and the truth is... As of yet, it's very, very difficult uh, to, to, to confirm this or deny this. Because again, Josephus is our principal source on the issue. Um, another very important issue is, did he tell the truth about his own life and career? Okay, um, I'm going to get to this because Josephus wrote an awful lot about himself. In fact, himself was probably his favorite subject. Um, and he wrote extensively about himself in the Jewish war and about himself in his own autobiography. Um, and the question then becomes, okay, to what extent can we trust him? Because as we'll see, he had firstly enormous pressures on him from every side and b um he was you know he obviously wanted to portray himself in the best light possible and to what extent can we believe what he says well to what extent can we not believe so these are all interesting questions and finally how did he present the jewish people in the jewish religion again i want to remind you that he's writing all the writings that he does takes place while he's living in rome after the destruction of the second temple and among a gentile population who are very very mixed feelings about the jews in fact many of them hated the, the you know hated judaism hated jewry uh, and then the question is okay so how did josephus try and portray his own people and his own religion and then i guess the final question which we'll get to right at the end was was josephus a good jew <laughs> which is also a very good uh, a very good question how, and how should we uh, come to understand Josephus, okay? And we're going to talk a lot about Josephus' biography today uh, because unlike many of the later historians, uh, like even Dawood, firstly, we know a lot about his biography, and secondly, his biography is very important. So um, Josephus, he was born to an elite priestly family in Jerusalem. This is actually quite important. Um, he was born to a family of Kohanim, one of the, 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 first, the family, I think, uh, of Yehoyariv, uh, or one of the 24 families of, of the Mishmarot, of the sort of, um, uh, the, 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 uh, I don't say the Mishmarot of, of, of the Mikdash, and of those who served in the Beit Mikdash. Um, and, uh, and apparently he grew up he was pro quite precocious. Uh, he was very skilled in languages. He knew a lot of languages. <coughs> and he wrote in Greek and Aramaic and Hebrew. He really knew, uh, he, he was very talented in that sphere. Um, he claims to have had, uh, to have a tremendous knowledge of the Torah and of the sort of the oral law. And, and you know, he portrays himself as, as being among the greatest in Jerusalem on that score. Um, the, you know, that doesn't seem all that likely, but nonetheless, uh, interesting that he would portray himself as such. Um, and as I said before, in his youth, he actually spent, you write, he spent time among the various sects. He kind of floated between the, the Pharisees, 
uh, which, which he grew up in, the Sadducees. He spent time in the Midbar Yehuda with the, with the Essenes. Um, and and he, he sort of writes about all this from a first-person perspective. Uh, and you can just imagine the young Josephus, um, you know, part of the, the sort of wealthy, well-schooled Jerusalem elite, a kind of, uh, you can imagine him as a kind of a wealthy trust fund kid who goes to India and tries to, you know, a spiritual seeker and, and you know, trying to find himself religiously and whatever. So you, can, you can sort of paint your own picture, of course, you know, uh, allowing for the different conditions of the first century CE. But, but yes, that, that's, it seems to be how Josephus was in his youth. Um, at the age of 26, he must have been a very talented and very well-born uh, and very well-presenting young uh, man, because at the age of 26, he was dispatched by the uh, Sanhedrin, by the, the Jerusalem authorities, to Rome in an effort to release prisoners. The Roman governor at the time, a man called um, uh, Florus, had arrested and sent to trial in Rome various Kohanim, various priests. Um, those priests needed someone to, there to defend them, to present their case to the emperor. Josephus, at a very young age, was dispatched to Rome in an effort to release the prisoners. Now, what's interesting is Josephus stayed in Rome for two years. Okay, He stayed in Rome much longer than the actual trial itself. And, and this made a huge impression on him. Like, he spent two years really at the heart of Rome, understanding their political system, understanding their language, understanding their culture, understanding their society. And, and really, um, you know, in a way... He spent an enormous amount of time at the very heart of the enemy's uh, uh, culture, and, and he really understood them like like probably very few other people in Judea understood them. And this is very important for understanding Josephus's life. And of course, during that time, he also would have understood diaspora Jewry very well, because again, you you must remember, like a little bit like today, there were some significant differences between uh, Judaism in Israel, which was very let's say temple centric uh, and, and and you know temple focused, and the kind of Judaism that you would find in Alexandria, which was you know perhaps best exemplified by the great homilies and and philosophy of Philo and others, and, and Rome and other great. Jewish centers abroad who obviously didn't have this kind of temple uh, and therefore developed a little bit of a different kind of Judaism. Uh, and Josephus must have seen that kind of Judaism, that kind of, and also that kind of Roman culture. Anyway, in the year 66 CE, everything changes because the Judeans rebel finally fully against the Romans, uh, massacre the, the, the Jerusalem uh, um, garrison of the Romans. And basically, uh, Rome, who uh, one of the things the Roman Empire did was um, they always came back and avenged um, their, uh, you know, or, or any sort of outlying province that misbehaved. So the Romans would send massive legions and absolutely decimate them. And so the year 66 to 67 was a time in which the Jews were expecting the Romans to come back any, you know, any minute now um, with enormous amounts of, of um, you know, with, with huge forces and, and overwhelming power. Um, and therefore, um, and therefore they had to go and prepare for it. So this is even before the Romans come. Uh, the moderates, the the uh, sort of the moderates who were connected to the Jerusalem Sanhedrin was at this point uh, of the rebellion still very much in charge. And the young Josephus was sent to the Galil uh, to assume command of the forces. Now this is very odd. Josephus then was still very young didn't really have a military experience and also wasn't very welcome in the Galil, okay? Uh, there was constant, constant infighting among Jewish groups. Um, there was another man called Yohanan Migush Chalav or John Giskala, who was uh, claiming leadership then as well. Um, and basically Josephus, even before the Romans stepped foot once in the land, had a terrible time trying to unify and, and organize the various forces, the rebel forces he had in the Galil, because many of them weren't loyal to him and weren't loyal to the to the, the sort of um, the leadership of the Sanhedrin and, and rejected him and, and basically, um, you know, even before the Romans arrived, it was clear that the Jews were not in any kind of shape to to um, to stand up to the Romans. The Romans invade in 67 CE and actually target the Galil first. And um, the Jewish cities, as I say, were disunited, disorganized, uh, and very quickly fell one after another after another. Um, and the last stand at Yodfat, at uh, Jotapata, um, what, that was the last stand in the northern region. And Josephus and 40 men flee into a cave. And this is how Josephus tells the story, um, which is that basically they all drew lots. Uh, and and how, how it worked was that they decided, you know, we're going to do a suicide pact. Every one of us is going to die. And Josephus managed to arrange it that he and someone else would be the last two standing so that every man would kill someone else, would kill his fellow, kill his fellow, kill his fellow. And, him, and Josephus and one other man was... Um, was um, uh, was left alive. And basically the idea was none of them would surrender to the Romans, but at the last moment, Josephus managed to convince the other man left with him that the two of them would go out and surrender to the Romans. And this was seen as a big act of treachery. Now, I want to pause here before going on to, before discussing this particular episode, because it really was the episode, sort of the fulcrum of Josephus's life. But the big question that has to be asked, which is the big question that stands at the very center of Josephus's entire life story is as follows. Was this, so to speak, betrayal here something 
let's say, a one-time event? Or was this something Josephus had planned for a while because Josephus didn't actually want to rebel against Rome? Okay, uh, I'll remind you, there were a group of zealots, you know, obviously who were absolutely gung ho about this rebellion and saw the rebellion against Rome as a, a you know, an absolute necessity. And there were the moderates in Jerusalem who did eventually, uh, you know, were eventually pulled into rebellion. But there were many Jews, including many powerful Jews, who saw a rebellion against Rome as absolute madness, as as certain suicide. To give a, a, a you know a, an analogy today, it would be like the uh, Hasidim in Williamsburg declaring war on the United States Army. Well, what are you doing? What, what do you what do you think you're going to stand up? What a ridiculous idea! Right. This is madness leading to certain death. And therefore, there are many Jews. And the question is, where on this spectrum did Josephus really belong? OK, he was dispatched to the Galil. Did Josephus, was he in fact gung ho about the revolt, really wants to rebel against the Romans? And only now in this cave, when facing certain death, he went out and surrendered. In other words, was his quote unquote betrayal of the Jews in a, a new one time thing? Or is it possible that from the very beginning, Josephus wasn't very happy about this revolt, that he actually didn't want to fight at all? That actually, you know, um, if it was up to him, he wouldn't have uh, uh, rebelled against the Romans, that he actually maybe on purpose did not lead the Jews particularly well. And therefore his eventual um, sort of, um, you know, uh, eventual uh, betrayal, his eventual uh, going over to the Roman side was something not out of character at all, but actually very consistent with his upbringing, with his education, with spending two years in Rome and with considering himself you know, part of the Roman Empire, part of the sort of uh, multicultural elite, rather than any kind of, uh, you know, force that wants to rebel against Rome. These are questions that we don't know the answer to. And this is what historians speculate on today. Was Josephus really in the Jewish camp until the last minute, or really not much in the Jewish camp? Um, and therefore, obviously, he was going to betray himself. Anyway, getting back to our story, Josephus is one of the only two to emerge alive. Now, he surrenders to the Romans, and he's taken to Vespasian, the um, Roman general. Uh, probably on account of his rank, because he was a senior ranking officer. Now, he, this is the big curious moment. All the other Judean rebels, generally, uh, were either killed <coughs> or crucified, generally, uh, or enslaved, sent back to, to Rome and, and enslaved. And Josephus wasn't. He was kept by, Ves by Vespasian as a sort of an aide, a translator, a go-between between the Romans and, and, and the rebels, and generally was kept as, as a fairly useful uh, officer within the Roman camp. But the question is why? Why did Josephus, why was he not killed or, or, or enslaved? Why instead did he become a quasi-Roman official during the time of this revolt? How did that happen? Now, Josephus himself tells a story. And the story is that Josephus goes to Vespasian and says, I have a prophecy. And the prophecy is that you will become emperor. Okay. Now, there was no... There was no reason for Vespasian or anyone else to think this is true. Um, however, the year six, as the as the um, revolt wore on, the year sixty eight to sixty nine of the Common Era was known as the year of the four emperors. Okay, and the year of the four emperors was the time when I, I believe it was Nero uh, uh, initially uh, died, and basically there was a series of of claimants to to his succession. That each basically each of the major garrisons of, of the Romans in different parts of the empire, um, you know, backed their own leading general to be the the emperor. And eventually, Vespasian was was one of these candidates. And eventually, he was the fourth and, and final emperor. Eventually, Vespasian won this sort of mini Game of Thrones within the Roman Empire and uh, became the emperor. And therefore, seemingly validating Josephus's prophecy. Now, this is the story Josephus told. The question is. Is any of this true, right? There are several reasons to ask this question. Firstly, it's because some of you may have um, may have noted already that this story sounds an awful lot like another story. And that story, of course, I'm referring to is the story of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, the story in the Talmud and in, uh, in other in other rabbinic literature, which tells similarly of Rabbi Yochanan ben, ben Zakkai, who goes out and predicts the, the, the Vespasian's rise to be an emperor, and, and, and that happens, oh my gosh. Um, and so the question is, what is the relationship between these two stories? Did Josephus craft the story and later Chazal attribute this to Yochanan ben Zakkai? Was this a story about Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai that Josephus stole and attributed to himself? Uh, were the two of them sharing some sort of common, well, is this a coincidence with the two of them sharing some sort of common motif prior, uh, you, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, building off their own story and, and creating their own, um, their own sort of, so to speak, mythology from this. And don't forget the, the source for the story of ben, uh, Yochanan ben Zakkai comes about three or four centuries after the uh, after the actual rebellion, after the revolt. So we're talking about a very large gap. Or could it be that jo it seems most likely, and again, I'm giving my own opinion here, but but I think many historians believe this, it seems most likely that, that Josephus made up this story as a, as a, as a clever story 
Um, but really, that he made a fortunate sort of political gamble, that he managed to convince Vespasian and later Titus, who took over, the Vespasian son who took over, um, of his usefulness. And managed to convince them that he was a useful go-between, that he knew everything, that he that he was able to help them in various ways. And therefore, they saw him and, and, and made use of him and his service that was good enough that they kept him along. That seems to be most likely the story. Josephus, of course, wanted to craft something much more um, impressive sounding for himself. Um now, and as I said before, he continues to go between, and, and he was, uh, he was, uh, he was, uh, you know, the question being, was he again, was he truly a Jew who, you know, reluctantly at the point of the sword went over to the Roman side and helped them, or no, was he always this kind of quasi-Roman citizen who never really wanted to fight at all, and then he went over to the Roman side and just, uh, and you know, and did what he did. Anyway, <clears throat> the, obviously, as we all know, how the um, how the rebellion ends in absolutely terrible circumstances, hundreds of thousands killed, uh, the beta, uh, Jerusalem raised to the ground, the Beit HaMikdash destroyed, etc., 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 and what happens is Josephus relocates to Rome. He is um, he is given uh, a Roman citizenship. He receives a, a pension, a sort of lifetime um a lifetime pension from the house of the emperor. And that's why he adopted the, the, the name of the emperor's house. He became Josephus Flavius. He was Yosef ben Matityahu before. He was Josephus Flavius. And he became a kind of court writer, a, 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 an imperially backed writer um, for the um, for, for the uh, emperor's court, noting that it's very important that um, many of these courts had these sorts of scribes and historians in order to write things that flattered the royal court. Okay, this is quite a, a de rigueur, and Josephus became one of those. Um, he was apparently absolutely despised by Jews in both in Rome and around the world. He, he they wanted nothing to do with him. He wanted nothing to do with them. And until really modern times, until the twentieth century, uh, and this revision of, Ju of Josephus, which I'll speak about a little bit later, uh, he was seen as a major traitor, as someone who was <coughs> someone who was absolutely, um, you know, uh, beyond the pale, and 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 someone who you know, a turncoat of the worst kind. And now he's being reevaluated, and I'll talk a bit about that later. Um, he wrote enormous amount, we're going to get to in the next few slides, his various works um, and what they said and, and how they were constructed and their historical value, um, both ancient and modern history. And to Josephus, we, we owe an enormous amount, as I said before, enormous amount of that information about the Second Temple period. Um, and in terms of his personal life, we know he was married several times. So his, um, his, his first wife was killed in the siege, um, some point during the rebellion, uh, a second a second wife was given to him while he was working for the Romans. The third wife in Rome, who left him, and I think there was a fourth wife uh, somewhere towards the end of his life. Um, and he has known at least three uh, known surviving sons, and he died at about 100 CE, maybe slightly after. Um, and that, that's essentially the the life of Josephus uh, al Regal Achat. And um, again, a fascinating figure. Um, so now we have his biography. So what about his writings? What about th that which he put on paper? So he wrote a number of very important books. Now the first one was um, the book called the Jewish War. The War of the Jews is often translated, <coughs> and this was obviously an account of the rebellion, um, and 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 a very very important account. And again, I, I cannot stress this enough, which is that actually no, I'll. I'll Talk about this when we get when we get uh, towards the end of the, the of this particular slide. Um, so, firstly, this is very important: is that actually all we have is the Greek version. We know that Josephus also wrote an Aramaic version of this uh, account of the war for the Jews, and we've lost that. And all we have is the Greek version, which of course was written for the Romans, you know, under the editorial direction of the Romans and for the benefit of the Romans. Okay, and as I said before, you know, when, when reading history, one has to take into account the various pressures that were being exerted on the historian. Well, in this case, the pressures are very, very clear, right? Uh, which is that he ha he could not possibly write an account which did anything other um, or which, which sort of deviated from the quote unquote the official Roman party line. Okay, so all we have is the Greek version. Maybe, hopefully, one day we'll have a sort of a Dead Sea Scroll-like discovery somewhere, and we'll discover a, a new version of the Aramaic version and, and see how Josephus told the story to the Jews. But right now, we don't have that. Um, now, what Josephus aims in writing the work? So I said already to paint the emperor and his decisions in the best possible light. So for instance, in this work, Josephus makes the very controversial claim that the Romans did not intend to burn down the Beit Mikdash. That this was an accident. That this was something that Titus himself had warned against. He, he he ordered not to do this, but then you know some of the legionaries decided to do it anyway. And uh, and you know in the frenzy, pitch frenzy of the battle, this happened. Now, of course, this go runs completely contrary to the picture of Titus that is um, portrayed in the writings of Chazal. For instance, if you read the Gemara, there are various Agadic passages that speak of Titus, the Titus uh, Harasha, and you know in the burning of the Beit Mikdash and the various uh, you know uh, horrific things that were done there. Um, and again, of course, the question becomes whose account is more or less valuable. 
Uh, and, you know, and again, the question remains open to this day. Um, now, a second and very important account, uh, a very important reason for writing the Jewish war was to allow for reconciliation between Jews and Romans. Because don't forget, in the Roman emperor, there were, in the Roman Empire, there were still millions of Jews living. They were living in Rome and they were living in Egypt and Alexandria. They were living in various uh, Greek islands. And, and, you know, it, it was very important for Josephus to, to point out that this war wasn't some sort of inherent, inevitable counter, uh, you know, cultural kampf between Jews and Rome. No, this was an accidental, unfortunate, uh, you know, end result of a political process. But actually, the Jews and Romans could live together and actually should live together, right? It was, a, a, you know, under... Its underlying message was a plea for sanity and a plea for coexistence between Jews and Ro Romans. Um, and finally, of course, to explain his own actions in a favorable light, right? And and we'll get to a bit more of this uh, later. And, and bottom line, that Josephus uh, um, um, portrayed the war as the fault of a few zealots, right? That there was a minority of terrible Jews, you know, secret He has very, very harsh words to say about the zealots. And, you know, they were anti-Jewish and that, you know, nothing to do with true Judaism, et cetera, et cetera. And that they poisoned the minds and they assassinated people and that they, you know, incited the mob, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why you have a war, but otherwise Jews are very peaceful and the Romans are very good. Josephus is very, you know, very pro-Roman. He, he sees Roman administration of the empire as essentially just and essentially good. And he also sees Jews and Judaism as essentially ethical and essentially spiritual, and therefore tries to argue for a kind of synthesis between the two, um, and, and which he does, of course, also in his antiquities, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, also, now here's, here's something that Josephus walks a very delicate line in this book and in his autobiography, which is, he can't portray himself completely as a Jewish, uh, as a traitor to his own people, because that won't sit well uh, with anyone, right? The Romans don't respect someone who's a traitor to their own people. He also has to portray himself as pro-Roman, but he also has to portray himself as a, as a fairly competent military leader, right? And, and, and it's not easy to do all these three at once. And therefore, you know, Josephus uh, has several... Accounts of his own heroism and his own brilliant, you know, um, uh, t tactics and strategies in battle, which many modern historians have, you know, dismissed as, as complete nonsense uh, and don't tally at all with other accounts of the of the revolt. Um, and in general, but, but Josephus has to kind of play himself as, as all things to all people within this um, within this particular uh, account. Um, however, what's the most important of this account is that it is a very good account, right? It is, in general, very well written. It's very moving. It's very detailed. It includes a lot of documents and a lot of military records. It is actually a good work of history in many ways. When Josephus is not talking about himself, he's actually often a good historian, especially when he's inculcating, uh, sorry, including many... Um, Many of the sources we have at the time, and some of his passages are extremely moving. I mean, I'll just give a very brief one here, talking about when the, the, the when the, the the old city, the walls were finally breached, and the Romans finally rushed in. It says, as the legions charged in, neither persuasion nor threat could check their impetuosity. Everywhere there was slaughter and flight. Most of the victims were peaceful citizens, weak and unarmed, butchered wherever they were caught. Round the altar. He, the heap of corpses grew higher and higher, while the sanctuary steps poured down a river of blood, and the bodies of those killed at the top slithered to the bottom. Right? I mean, this is this is, is heartrending stuff. Right? And in fact, I've heard this suggestion before, and I'm very much for it that bits of Josephus' Jewish wars should be read by Jews every year on Tisha B'Av. I mean, this is the best first-hand account. He was there. He was at the siege of Jerusalem. He was watching the Romans go in and and just the carnage and mass slaughter and suffering. Um, and and again, this is a, an account which to us, is extremely important. And I've written here, if only we had Jewish, Jewish for other periods of Jewish history, and I'll tell you why. If anyone wants to try and study, for instance, the Bar Kokhba revolt, the Bar Kokhba revolt took place only 70 years later, but we don't have a Josephus for the Bar Kokhba revolt. We know very little about the Bar Kokhba revolt. We actually, I was surprised when reading into this a few months ago for another project that how little we know about it, right? We have a few letters and a few coins and a bit of this and that. We don't know really how long it lasted, the Bar Kokhba revolt. We don't really don't know what their, um, you know, what they achieved and what they didn't achieve. Did they capture Jerusalem? Did they not? You know, how, how total, uh, what, what were their battles? Where were they fought? What were the casualties like? We actually don't know any of this, or, or, or rather, we know very little of this because of because Bar Kokhba didn't have a Josephus. The, we are incredibly indebted to Josephus for for the causes of the war, for you know the battles of the war, for this period of Jewish history. It it is astonishing that we have a very a generally very vivid, moving, and largely accurate portrayal of what went on. So this is Josephus' first uh, major accomplishment. The second major set of books, and this is an enormous set of books, a 20-volume 
set of books called the Antiquities of the Jews, okay, uh, written by Josephus. And um, this is a, a, um, a, an account of the Jews now the po uh, um, from the creation of the world down to his own period. Now, this is very interesting uh, because in the Roman world, um, there was this belief, there's this fascination with antiquity. Right, this fascination with ancient Greece, fascination with ancient, uh, you know, you know, other ancient tribes, and, and you know, religious systems and, and and tribal systems which go back to great antiquity. This was seen as 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 very respectable in the eyes of the Romans. And jo Josephus sort of capitalized on it and basically provides something which which I think has almost been unequaled in the history of Jewish history, which is a complete and total comprehensive Jewish history from the creation of the world down to his own day, including all the customs and including the practice, including the developments and everything good is at hand on to prove to the Romans uh, the, the antiquity and richness of the Jews. And this is very interesting because within Roman culture uh, at the time, there was this this, this odd tension between um, the, the tremendous anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism, which was you know rife among the, many Romans, but also a fascination with, with, uh, with Jews. And in fact, Many uh, there were many who converted to Judaism. In fact, the conversion to Judaism was such a problem within ancient Rome that at one point they actually banned it. They banned any uh, on the pain of death, I believe, any kind of missionary work or any kind of conversion work among the Jews because so many people were so interested in it. And you know they were fascinated by the idea of one God, fascinated by the idea of an afterlife and by the Messiah and there were many elements of the Jewish religion. So Josephus, this was a work portraying Judaism in the best light. Now, it's a very interesting work uh, for many ways. Now, the first ten. Um, um, uh, the first 10 or so books, uh, 10, 11 books, something like that, uh, of the antiquities is a recapitulation of the history of the Bible. Uh, now, this is very interesting because you see here, firstly, a generally faithful um, recapitulation of the Bible. However, through Josephus' lens, again, Josephus as the kind of, I would say, Hellenized Jew, but, but you know, a Jew who preferred the, the Judaism of Rome and Alexandria over the, 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 the kind of Judaism of the Jerusalem temple. And therefore, you know, uh, Abraham was this great philosopher who discovered God. And Moses was this great political genius who forged a people. And, uh, you know, certain... Um, certain accounts, for example, that the Egel Hazav is completely missed out because Josephus this clearly didn't reflect well in the Jews, so Josephus just missed it out. Um, and the chronologies, for example, I, I'm sure people here are aware, there are chronological difficulties within the Hebrew Bible or tensions between, let's say, um, the um, the books of, of Malachim and the books of, of um, Divrei Hayamim, the books of Kings and Chronicles. So Josephus kind of papers this over. He does a good job of, of synthesizing the two. And it's interesting because he clearly was aware of the differences uh, uh, that we have here. He also has certain uh, Midrashic readings uh, uh, and you know brings in his own uh, you know traditions, as it were. And he also has, and I'm not an expert on this, but I've seen some literature on this, uh, that Josephus did have also a slightly different halachic tradition than we see recorded in the... Um, in the writings of Chazal, and again, this is very interesting, very plausible, because of course, you know, there must have been other traditions and other practices uh, which were then part of the oral law, which didn't quite make it, weren't quite canonized in in Shas as we know it today. Um, and then there are a few books on the on the Persian and Ptolemaic eras, and these were, were not considered very good or very successful books in general. These these, these uh, Josephus did not have much to rely upon here. Um, however, then we have uh, the, the the last I think uh, five or six books of the Antiquities, uh, which describe. The Hellenistic and Roman eras. Now, Josephus himself, interestingly enough, was a descendant of the the Hasmonean dynasty. He was a descendant of the Hasmonean royalty, um, and he really gave an incredible, uh, incredibly detailed, an excellent description of uh, the, the the Hellenistic, the Hasmonean, and Roman eras. It's an extraordinary treasure trove of information. As I said, by far the best historical information that we have about that time. Of course knowing that Josephus had to, A, be careful about what he said about the Romans, and B, um, you know, had certain biases or certain things that he wanted people to know and to believe. And, and you know, and again, that should be borne in mind. But nonetheless, reading the last few books of the uh, of the Antiquities of the Jews is an extraordinary um, lesson in what Second Temple, late Second Temple Judaism was like, and also a very good description of the political um, um, turmoil that led to the revolt. Josephus was very interested in, in sort of... Um, outlining how this this revolt which he just which he saw as like a terrible clash between the two civilizations that he loved how this came to be right um he's also useful because josephus quotes you know verbatim and 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 you know and and says so many documents and authors that we no longer have and was josephus is also a treasure trove of ancient writers 
who we otherwise would never heard of, and also ancient documents of, you know, from Roman imperial, uh, you know, and, and, and just their archives, which of course have been lost many, many, many centuries ago, but because of Josephus, we still have them, and that is very useful to historians today. Um, it also demonstrates the complex act attitudes of, of Jews and Romans, as I said before, that, that you know, again, some Jews saw the Romans in a very po positive light, some Jews didn't, so, uh, and, you know, the various different sects and, and you know, the moderate uh, rebels and the extreme rebels and the various different types of zealotry and the various different types of Jews who, you know, who took the Roman side. Um, and in fact, I mean, I should have mentioned this before, but many, um, many, many officials, many, you know, both administrative officials and mil military officials in the Roman apparatus were Jews. Right. And, and some of them were even high ranking Jews. In fact, one of the senior Roman commanders, if I recall correctly, during the revolt was the nephew of Philo Alexandria, Philo of Alexandria, I believe, uh, you know, a very important uh, um, Alexandrian Jewish family. Uh, and so, again, there's a very complex uh, array of tensions of views from the Romans to the Jews and the Jews to the Romans. And Josephus captures this very well. Um, he also has a couple of other uh, works, which I'm going to mention only very, very briefly here, uh, which is, number one, his autobiography, much of it just the defense of his own record in the war, reiterating that he was a Jewish patriot and was a good general, but also was pro-Roman and, 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 you know, all the things I mentioned above. Uh, and also he wrote another two-volume work called Against Appium. And that's also a very interesting work uh, because apparently there was this... Um, this Roman uh, uh, writer called Appion, who, um, and others, he quotes many others, who regurgitated various uh, anti-Semitic uh, libels or conspiracies, including uh, cannibalism and, and human sacrifice and all such things uh, against, the, against the Jews. And Josephus basically countering this and, uh, and, and explaining why, in his eyes, Judaism is a sort of superior ethical system and superior political system, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And again, it's, it's a defense of the Jews. Um, so, so in sum... Uh, let's let's uh, I'll reiterate some of the things I've been saying. So now the first is that Josephus is crucial because we rely upon him. Okay, as this uh, this picture in the top right corner, you know, Josephus wrote an awful lot, you know, twenty volume uh, or twenty part work of the, of the Antiquities, uh, the War of the Jews uh, against Appian. These are incredibly valuable, and also, um, you know, we we simply don't have other evidence for a lot of the things that Josephus write, and therefore Josephus is the gold standard. I mean, th that's just what we have. And uh, um, okay, he also, funnily enough, um, a lot of Josephus' work survived because of a later interpolation. Okay. In one little, it, it's weird. There's one tiny paragraph in the Antiquities, about, I don't know, four or five sentences long, something like that, uh, in which Josephus is, at least as we have it today, is recorded to write, oh, and in in uh, you know during all this time, in let's say the, tw the 20s or 30s of the Common Era, uh, there was an extraordinary man who rose, a great teacher and a great prophet called Jesus, and, and they took him to be the son of God, and he was crucified, and then he rose to the, from the dead to his followers, and, uh, and basically something like that. Now, universally today, this is seen as... A, um, as a later interpolation by Christian uh, writers. So at some point in the second or third century, some Christian scribe who was copying down Josephus' work decided to put this in. And on the one hand, this is, of course, an act of great um, desecration, as it were, on, on, on a great historical work. But on the other hand, this ensured its its survival because that the, 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 meant that the church fathers and others uh, were interested in Josephus' work. So the Jews were not interested in Josephus' work. The Jews rejected Josephus and hated Josephus. And only a few, very few uh, among the Jewish intellectual elite had heard or ever read Josephus until the modern time. But the Christians kept him, again, largely because of this tiny uh, paragraph that's almost certainly not written by Josephus um, that was written in the Antiquities, in antiquities about, uh, about Jesus. Okay. Um, um, yeah, so, so he wrote a huge amount. Uh, and again... Uh, a lot of it cannot be verified, but some of it is very verifiable, um, and and you know it does tally with modern archaeology and does tally with some of the discoveries made in the modern period. And therefore, Josephus is seen as generally a fairly good source of information. Um, um, he was also, as I say, reasonably good as a historian. As I said before, relies quotes a lot of other first person recollections, uh, state records, military records, other writers of the time. He his books. Um, often re resemble kind of grand collation of other sources, which, again, is the practice generally of a good historian, um, or at least a discerning historian, a historian who, who knows, firstly, how to give credit where credit's due, but also the fact that he doesn't know everything and has to rely on the works of others and wants to try and get it right. Um, and there was one, I, I can't remember where I heard this, but um, in one lecture I once heard about Je Josephus, it says that Josephus is at his best when relying on others, right? In other words, Josephus is the best, is you know, does his best historical work when he says, oh, and I found this account, and I know about this record, and here, look at this list, um, and, and that's, you know, that's Josephus at his very best. Um, he has some, some uh, weaknesses. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, the um, books, 
can't, again, I can't remember exactly which books of the antiquities it is that deal with the Persian and early Hellenistic period, but those are generally seen as as Josephus's weak point, and he mixes up the chronology. Something terrible there, um, and and uh, and you know. Basically, seems to falsify or not falsify. Seems to essentially make up um, certain parts of the historical records, and and you know the, the sources he relied rely upon, he relied upon seem to be very um, um, unreliable. And and so again, he's obviously not anything like a perfect or or, or you know scientific historian, and definitely had his weak points. Um, he was obviously constrained in what he could say, right? And this is something crucial to to pay attention to, which is that he was at the end of the day a court historian. Now the truth is that Josephus was quite a brave historian if he was a court historian, because some of the things that he writes doesn't always portray the Romans in the most flattering light. I mean, obviously, I I, uh, I read you out a, a passage before, you know, the, the indiscriminate slaughter, um, although not, not many Romans would have actually seen that as necessarily negative, um, slaughtering, you know, uh, an entire province who had rebelled. Uh, but nonetheless, Josephus had to always say, oh, you know, what a brilliant tactician Vespasian was, and, you know, and and how Titus, you know, really tried not to, not to kill, you know, not to go overboard, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he had to remain guarded, and he had to he obviously had certain biases or certain things that that animated his writing. So uh, he had to protect himself. He had to protect his legacy. Um, he also, interestingly, and, and certainly from our perspective, very importantly, he wanted to portray Judaism in the best possible light. In other words, Josephus was a, a very a fairly widely read and widely respected uh, a writer in his time, and it's very significant that he de de dedicated an enormous amount of his work to portraying Judaism as well as possible, as flatteringly as possible, as um, as universalistically as possible, and this is very important because, again, uh, you know, he was the Jew that many, the Jewish authority that many were relying upon in his time for accurate information, uh, and he was also the conviction that he, that his own kind of Judaism was was you know uh, the superior alternative. Um, I, I end up with this quote from Churchill, which is "History shall be kind to me, for I intend to write it." Right, it's a great line by by Churchill, and of course, Churchill wrote many many works of history, not least his um, his four part history of the Second World War, which of course you know <laughs> portrayed him in the best possible light in many ways and um and for which he actually won the nobel prize funnily enough um but um but but there's something to that with josephus as well in other words it's very hard for us to judge josephus because the only sources we have for josephus was josephus and therefore it's, uh, it's hard for us to say ah in light of other sources okay we only can work with what we have however very interesting to note that it's very possible to see uh you know some some have seen or let's say it's classic to see Josephus as a bad Jew and a good historian. And both of those are up for debate because he was on the one hand a bad Jew in the sense that he you could see him as a traitor to the cause of, of the rebellion and you know someone who lived in luxury in Rome while the Jerusalem burned and that sort of thing. However, if Josephus really did see the revolt as an act of madness, if he really didn't think that this was going to bring anything other than absolute terrible catastrophe and carnage on the Jewish people, maybe he saw it as his moral duty not to be, or, or, or you know, maybe he was always very reluctant to play his part in the revolt. And 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 as a historian, maybe he had weaknesses in his, in his ability as a historian, but much of it was devoted to, um, as I said before, to pay, painting Judaism, Jewish practice, Jewish history in a very positive and very palatable light for his Roman audience. And therefore, we can say as Jews living 2000 years later, maybe he wasn't such a bad Jew after all. Maybe actually he was an important Jew. Maybe he was a Jew, uh, uh, you know, who, who who saved Jews a tremendous amount of, let's say, bad reputation. And, uh, and, perhaps, and of course, provided us with absolutely unparalleled historical information about our own Jewish history. And for that, maybe we should remember him uh, for good. Okay, I think I've spoken quite enough. I'm going to stop my share. Ah, well, some of you have remained with me throughout the course of the lecture. I'm very impressed. Um, I'll open up uh, for questions. Anyone, questions or observations, uh, just I don't know, raise your hand and I'll I'll uh, pick on you. Feel free to unmute or raise your hand. There was a yeah. chat box. Uh, we have a question. Where is it? Uh, one second. Seems to have been deleted. I think. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's been deleted. Rob? Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Thank you very much. Um, just the, you mentioned the Christian editing potentially of the text. Is there any other like critical um, analysis where people think the text might have been changed over time by different people? Or is it, and most people are quite solid, that this, this is quite authentic? So funnily enough, um, until the mid, until like the seventies or eighties or something like that, 
Um, there was a theory going around that actually Josephus didn't write all of this, and and you know, because it, it was it was so massive and so you know uh, all encompassing. People thought, oh, this is the work of many hands. But actually, since since the beginning of computer analysis for historical texts, that that theory has gone to the dustbin, and people have really believed that Josephus did, because the the writing and the style and the uh, it, it is so consistent that it really does seem to have come from from one person from one hand. Having said that. I know there are critical editions of uh, and and sort of um, annotated editions of Josephus. I know that sometimes they do um, pick out individual small elements which they believe to have been possibly changed or possibly edited retrospectively. Um, but in general, um, in general, it's a it's seen as one coherent body of text. Apart from this, which is one of the reasons this is seen as such an obvious uh, later interpolation, is firstly is mainly because it seems to say it seems to endorse the notion of Jesus being the Messiah and the Son of God. If which if 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 this is the case, don't you think that should be more focused upon during the life of Josephus? In other words, you're writing a whole twenty volume thing about the history of the Jews, and oh, by the way, there was a guy who came and and, and oh yeah, he did credible credible claims being the Messiah and the Son of God. One second, why why didn't Josephus then write one of the at least one of the four Gospels? We're gonna have a, a fifth Gospel called Josephus, all about the life of Jesus, because that should be. A huge portion, right? And so that, that's obviously one of the reasons why it, it seemed to to, uh, to be a later interpolation, and also because Christian scribes would do this, would amend later texts. In terms of other significant interpolations, I'm not aware, but um, I haven't heard uh, or read. But but uh, you know, I, I can't say for sure. I have a question in the chat box. If one is to start reading, studying Josephus, where should one start? Um, the War of the Jews. Definitely. Uh, first, it is much shorter, um, and and secondly, it's it, it tugs at the heartstrings a lot more, and it's uh, yeah, it, it's it's written more um, in a more thrilling manner. Antiquities can get a bit boring, um, especially because you know so much of the biblical history. So I'd say get the war, get the war of the Jews, and uh, and read it, and you'll see again. And and it's it's funny because it's actually not so hard for the modern even even someone who doesn't read that much history. To read a book like this and, and see the parts where Josephus is being like a really good punctilious historian and see the other parts where you're like, okay, you know, maybe he uh, maybe he's flattering himself a bit too much or maybe he's, uh, you know, that doesn't sound so credible. I'm not sure about that. And it's an interesting exercise to undertake. Uh, Avi. Firstly, thank you. Excellent. Um, you, uh, apologies if you've already answered it, but in terms of, is there evidence of Chazal, not Chazal, sorry, say in rabbinic literature, um any quoting of Josephus, any significant quoting? Um, um yeah. I would say I would say not that I know of. Okay. Not that I know of. Again, the, the major different major um exception might may be the um the Yohan ben, the Yohan ben Zakai story, right? Um but again the, other historians, contemporary historians seem to have said that this is not uh you know, that you know it's unlikely it's been copied, it's much more likely they were borrowing a, you know a shared motif or something like that. Um, it's possible, funnily enough, as well known, Chazal don't engage in a tremendous degree of history uh, or historical writing, therefore don't, um, don't seem to have, it, it, it would be hard to tell because they quote little of anything of this period. Um, it seems possible that some of them, certainly the more elite, you know, that those who are, of, let's say, Rabban Gamliel or Rabbi Nasi, people like that, who would have read Greek, who would have, you know, known... I imagine some of them would have come across Josephus on their bookshelf, um, but that doesn't seem to have made its way, to the best of my knowledge. Again, not being a Baki Bashas and uh, and all this stuff, but but they seem to have really occupied two separate worlds. And I remind you, Josephus was roundly despised by the Jews of his period. He was really seen as a traitor. And, and therefore, you know, th that was more or less that. On the note that he was really despised, when did he become accepted in the Jewish community? Well, look, he's. <laughs> the, I, I can actually give you a definite answer to that, because I spoke earlier of of Jewish history as being this kind of rebellion against the the religious, almost the religious historical worldview that 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 scientific history coming in to replace it in many ways, and one of them would be, of course, the um, the, the readmittance of people like Spinoza and people like Josephus, right? Uh, in other words, someone like Josephus is an excellent example of someone who who does not fit into the Jewish, either religious or national conceptions, let's say, um, but 
is immensely useful historically. Um, so I know he's, he's definitely, you know, by the time we're talking about the, the mid 19th century, the Jewish historians, then uh, Yost and Heinrich Gretz, they're quoting from Josephus extensively. Um, and, um, and you know, it's that that's so, so, so they're definitely aware of him then. Um, Azari de Rossi, who we will uh, we will talk about also, was aware of Josephus. Um, yeah, I, I, but, but the acceptance of Josephus comes along with the beginning of scientific history and academic history among uh, among Jews when trying to discover and explore their own past. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm, I'm a little disappointed that I've said so few controversial or, or objectionable things that uh, everyone's just happy to sit there and listen. I'm I'm, I'm sort of shocked and astonished. Um, you can throw some in right now if you want. If what? You can throw some controversial stuff right now quickly at the end. Uh, some controversial stuff? I, I don't know. I mean, I think the most controversial thing I said today is the the bit that I said at the end, which is that, you know, the question being, can we forgive Josephus for his sort of betrayal. In other words, and the truth is that even in classic Zionist historiography, right, the early Zionist historians also saw Josephus generally as a, as a traitor. You know, what do you mean? You know, he's the great traitor. To, he's the great example of a turncoat within the nationalistic cause. And now I'm giving, I basically have presented two reasons to revise this. Number one, it's very possible that Josephus was either secretly or not so secretly among the crowd who believed that this was folly, that this was madness. That this, what, this was a terrible, terrible idea. Again, like the Hasidim in Williamsburg declaring war on the United States Army. This, this is just... A terrible idea um, and and therefore you know maybe he that that could have justified it and the second thing is that josephus re, you know even as someone even if you reject that even if you see josephus as a, a traitor on the national level just in terms of providing us a picture of what jewish life was like of what judaism was like of what, what the temple was like of all the stuff th there's no there's no one who even comes up to the ankles of josephus and therefore that was a service he rendered to the jewish people which which should put him back among us at the very least you know Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, 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 yes, um, uh, Simon. Yeah, a thought that went through my mind when you were asking the question of why was he brought towards Vespasian when other uh, um, other leaders were executed? So I find myself wondering: Is it possible that he he was planted by the Romans, having been in Rome and gone back to Judea? What was he? Could he have been a double agent all along? Um, okay, th that seems far-fetched. Firstly, can I say, this was exactly what the other zealots accused him of. In other words, Josephus was on the moderate wing of the rebel party, and the, the other rebels, as I mentioned, Yohanan, I mean, Gush Kalav, John Giscala, and his allies, accused Josephus of essentially being a Roman plant, of being someone with sympathies to the Romans, right? That's what they accused him of. Whether the Romans actually planted him, that seems a little bit far-fetched for the... For a few reasons. Firstly, because Josephus was a, was appointed by the authorities in Jerusalem to lead the command, right? So he'd have to be a very good double agent to convince the leadership of the um, of the of the rebellion to essentially give him command of one of the biggest and most important areas of the country, right? So he'd have to be. If such things have happened. Such things have happened. Yeah. I, it, the answer is I can't discount it. It seems unlikely. It seems much more likely that Josephus harbored pro-Roman or at least anti-zealot ten anti-zealotry tendencies. I think what Josephus probably hoped was that the Jews, upon seeing the massive might of the Roman army, would just throw their hands up and say, you know, either surrender or or, or come to some sort of arrangement with the Romans, or or you know, basically not push it towards the end. And the truth is that. Had the zealots not taken Jerusalem, I have to remind you that, that I can't remember exactly when, I think the year 69, roughly, something like that, the zealots overthrew the moderate party in Jerusalem and, and took over the whole rebellion. Had that not happened, maybe there didn't need to be a siege of Jerusalem. Maybe there could have just been some sort of parley. The Jews would have surrendered, you know, gone back to being a Roman province. It's possible. It, you know, execute a few zealot leaders, but, you know, rebel leaders, but actually leave the country alone. It, it didn't need to end as it ended. And I think Josephus may have hoped that something like that would happen. And you know what? Honestly, I mean, you know, it's easy to say it two thousand years later and judge in hindsight because obviously hindsight twenty twenty. But maybe that would have been a good thing. You know, maybe we're talking about according to Josephus, over one point one million were killed. You know, we're talking about a, you know a, a real holocaust in Israel. Maybe that should have been avoided. You know, maybe a surrender to the Romans would have actually been preferable. We'd still have a bet Migdash, and we'd still have you know. It's possible to live under the Romans. The Jews lived under the Romans for a whole century before the before the rebellion. 
what you know so maybe Josephus's sympathies would have in the long run been better for the Jews who knows yeah this is uh yeah anyway okay so I think we'll close up the night for we'll close up Fantastic. the show Fantastic. Well, uh, Thank you very much. This has been a pleasure. And uh, so at the same time next week, we're going to be jumping into the medieval period and we're going to be discussing Abraham Ibn Dawood, um, um, who was, again, a, a, he's the best example of a Jewish medieval historian, even though he didn't write that much history. And we're going to discuss why the medieval Jews didn't write history and, and, and you know, and, and, and the general attitudes towards history. So we'll discuss some of that too. Amazing. Very excited. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming up. Stay safe. Thank you. We'll thank you. All the best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.